Hey family, how you going? We are in Galatians chapter 4 today for an overview. We're going to get right into it. Let's ask the Holy Ghost to come and help us. Because remember, we want the teacher to come and teach us the Word. Spirit of God, we praise you. And we thank you in your precious name that you help us to get out of this exactly what do you want us to hear. You know how to speak to us in every season of our life. You know exactly what we need. We turn this time over to you. In Jesus' name, illuminate what you want to tell us. Teach us about you, God. We want to know you more. Amen. As we've prayed in the Holy Ghost, we've now invited the teacher. Let's go into it. I'm going to read scripture by scripture. Remember, overviews are not to tell you every revelation, but they are to give you a basic picture. We hope you're enjoying your times in the growth book. We hope that you're going strong on this. Do it every day. Don't miss a day. Do it every day. Be in God's Word every single day. You need it. Man does not live on bread alone. Physical food will only help your physical body. But you have a spirit man who needs spiritual nourishment. He needs to be fed. Let me tell you this, for instance. Have you ever thought about the fact that you fight physical battles? Physical battles, fights, wars, they require cannons. They require guns. They require weapons that we make. Your physical body has, you can punch somebody, you could kick something, you can defend yourself physically. And those are the things that when you work out or you make sure you're mobile, you're walking around, what are you doing? You're making sure that your body is ready in case there might be an emergency situation you might have to take on. Well, that's the same thing when it comes to the spirit. You have a spirit man, but every battle that you're fighting in life, many of them are not physical. Actually, almost all of them, unless you're getting in fights every day, you know, physical fights, you're not fighting physical battles. You're fighting spiritual ones. We fight and wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual principalities, forces of darkness, and all these that are in the evil world. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying that you're fighting spiritual battles, so you cannot knock out with your fists demonic powers. You cannot choke hold demons. It doesn't matter how much you're working out at the gym, how much you're eating physical food. It's not going to help you in a spiritual battle against depression. It's not going to help you in the physical battle against suicidal thoughts, in the spiritual battle. It's not going to help you against trying to refine joy again, getting peace in your life again. These are spiritual battles. So what do you got to do? Train up your spirit man. As you physically fight those battles in the physical, he fights those for you in the spiritual. What do I mean he? The Bible calls him the inner man. Some other translations call him the spiritual man. The spiritual man, when you got saved, your spirit was completely saved. If you'll notice after you got saved, you still have the same body. You still have feelings and emotions. It's because you're made up of a body, a soul, and a spirit. Your body will be saved when we go to heaven. This body is going to be lived and you're going to be given a new body going to heaven. Your soul, the Bible says, is being saved. So it's in the process every day. Your emotions, your thoughts, and your will and desires are in the process every day of becoming more like Jesus. He's trying to constantly bring those desires toward his desires, your thoughts toward his thoughts, your emotions toward his emotions, what you should feel based on what the word of God says. God's trying to keep doing that. But your spirit, when you got saved, was born again. You physically did not go back into the womb of your mother, but your spirit was literally birthed anew, brand new baby. That's why the Bible talks about milk being fed to babies first, right? Spiritually, it's talking about. You have a spiritual man. So inside of you, there is a spirit. Now think about this. If your spirit is the one who is responsible for fighting all of your spiritual battles, then his, your spirit man's current state, how either strong he is or how weak he is, is whether now you are winning battles or losing them in the current state of your life. You're keeping yourself physically in shape. Maybe many of you eating healthy, thinking about your health. Are you thinking about your spiritual man's health, his strength, his power? See, if I were to look at some of our spirits, and this is for church people all over the world, we could look in, if I took a camera in and went to go visit your spirit man and I knocked on the door, would he even be able to get up and answer the door? Or is he so weak that he's laying in bed and he can't get out of bed? He's so malnourished that he actually is missing one eye. 
He can't walk properly because he has a gimpy leg. He can't get up from bed, let alone fight any battles because of how malnourished we have made him. Do you feed your spirit man? He's the one fighting the battles. If you find you're losing very easily to the flesh, if you find you're losing very easily and you're buying every lie that Satan has in your life right now, it's not because you're a bad person or anything's wrong with you. It could possibly just be that your spirit man is so weak that there's not even a fight of resistance against the flesh and the enemy right now because you have not fed him. That's what this growth book's about. That's what's going on. You need spiritual food. Never forget this. Your spirit man is fighting the battles. Are you feeding him or what state is he in right now? You know what? We can get about feeding him right now, building your faith, building your spirit man so that you can fight the battles God wants you to win and actually have joy. So as we go into Galatians 4, we came out, remember, every time that you read the next chapter, you want to go ahead and read the previous verses because the Bible was not written in verses and chapter. The Bible was written in huge thoughts, one letter. This is a letter. So in the last couple of verses of, of uh, chapter 3, right before this, we know that he was calling us. He said that you are now sons of God. You have clothed yourself with Christ. Now there's neither Jew nor Greek or any of them, no slave, no free, male or female, because you belong to Christ. You're Abraham's seed. And because you belong to Christ, you get the promise, just like everyone else. So let's move on with chapter 4. When I am saying, Paul says, is as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. He is subject to guardians and trustees until the set time by his father. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principle of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Pause there for a second. When it said the time had fully come, what that word fully come simply means is the perfect time. Jesus came at the perfect time. Just so you'll know, there was a lot of time that passed before Jesus came, that he could have come. I could talk about this for the next couple of hours, about the timing that Jesus came, all the events around it, but I won't, but I'll just say this. There were seven centuries that had already come that had been recorded. The Byzantines were there. There are many, many different centuries of people and people groups that had come before the time that Jesus came, but Jesus chose to come in the time of the Romans. There's a specific reason for that. But Jesus came in the perfect time. He came at a time that his message, which was the kingdom of God is near, repent for the kingdom of God is near. Receive me as your Lord and Savior. Receive me for a new kingdom is coming to earth. That message would be perfect in the time that he was given because all of the things, all of the cultures, all the surrounding things in Rome was literally in the same manner as the kingdom of God works. It was the manner of colonization. Colonization is the difference between when certain uh, wars would happen for the previous centuries. Uh, this was the barbarians would do it this way. Uh, Byzantines would do it this way. The different empires. They would go in and what they would do would they would conquer a land and then take the people out of that place and take them back to their homeland. Make them slaves bring them to that place, get them to work, all that. That's how every single kingdom did it until the Romans. What they said was they said, let's colonize the areas. So we're going to have this information called colonization, meaning we're going to go in, capture, destroy a land, but then we're going to send our governors or representatives from our kingdom of Rome, and we're going to go into their land and teach them to eat like Rome, teach them to talk like Rome, teach them to dress like Rome. We're going to go and make them like Rome. And that is why the Roman Empire lasted for over a thousand years, one of the longest lasting empires ever in history, the strength of it, because they implemented colonization. They didn't bring people back from their land and keep those lands empty. What they did was they sent people to teach them to be like Rome. That's why the saying got so uh, famous, honestly, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, where literally they were making every country be like Rome. That's the same principle of the kingdom. You see how Jesus could work with this? What does he do? He comes, he dies for us. And what does he send when he leaves? A kingdom is coming. I don't represent myself. I represent that kingdom. And I'm sending the governor, the representative from the kingdom. His name's the Holy Spirit. And he's coming in to teach you to be like Jesus, teach you to walk like Jesus, teach you to talk like Jesus, teach you to eat, teach you to act like the kingdom of heaven that he was sent from. 
That's what it's all about. You see, Jesus even knew the time he could come, and it's the perfect time. Let me challenge you with this before I move on. Many of us are so frustrated with God's timing in our life. I understand. Some things do not happen when we want them to. Some things do not come to pass when it would be the timing we would prefer. But can I encourage you? Jesus still is on the perfect time. He never is late and he's never early. He only shows up exactly when he's supposed to. Do you trust God's timing in your life? For a wife, maybe. Do you trust God's timing in your life for the promotion that you want? Maybe you want to get to a new job and you're just begging God, why am I still here? Can you hand over the trust and the timing of your life again? I'm speaking to somebody right now and I feel it. That you need to listen. Jesus has perfect timing. When he showed up on the scene as the seed in the woman and was born to a virgin, he came in the perfect fullness of time. He knows exactly when he showed up for the 30 years he didn't preach and minister. It was because he wasn't supposed to do it yet. Do you remember when he's at the banquet and the wedding and they ask him to turn the water into when they want more wine? He says to his mom when she asked him, go and do this. They ain't got no more wine. You got to do something. He says, it's not my time yet. <clears throat> he was so aware of the timing he was at. Everything he did was on time. And can I tell you to this day, Jesus still does things on time. Trust him. Give over your worries and cares. Know that he knows more than you do. And he has your back. He loves you. He only has thoughts of good and hope for you and to bring you a great end. He has things and he'll do it in the perfect time. Hallelujah. Verse 2. So what I am saying is he said, in, He is subject to the guardian so that under the time, and this is verse 4, but when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Verse 5, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Jesus came as the son of God to make us sons, to make us part of the family. Verse 6, because you who are sons, God sent the spirit of his son, the Holy Ghost, into our hearts. The spirit who calls out daddy, father, Abba, father, it means daddy, intimate terms, daddy, my father, my God. Some of y'all don't even know because many of you haven't had a father. Maybe you're sitting there and your father was at home, but he wasn't present. Maybe he was emotionally unresponsive. I don't know the situation you have with your father, but we have a father who loves us, who made us his son. You've been adopted into the family of God. Hallelujah. You are a family member. And as a son, you have all the rights of a son, meaning you get the inheritance. Verse 7, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you an heir. You don't just get part of the family. You now get everything the family has. Everything that belongs to Jesus, you get to take part of now. Are you taking advantage of the inheritance you have? Have you pulled on that inheritance? Have you demanded in prayer that inheritance? Have you asked God, said, Jesus, you gave this to me. I'm a son now. I get this inheritance. I want everything that's been given to me, God, because you paid such a price. You see, people think about it wrong. They think, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy of the price Jesus paid. And I totally agree. We're not worthy. But you need to get over yourself <laughs> and saying you're not worthy and realize that Jesus paid a price so incredible that none of us could have ever paid so that we would take advantage of the inheritance. So you know the only disservice we can do now as Christians? Not take advantage of the inheritance. You need to get everything God paid for you. You need to take advantage of all of it. Don't shrink back anymore and say, well, I'm not. Well, yeah, I know none of us were worthy, but Jesus said we were worthy. He loved us. He's the one who made the decision. We didn't. We couldn't have helped ourselves. He did it for us. Now we're not going to sit back for the rest of our lives now that we have been saved and made sons and still have nothing. Come on, y'all. Get the inheritance. Jesus paid the price. He came down from heaven of the divinity, unzipped his divinity, went into the womb of a woman, lived 33 years on this life, 
died the price that we deserved, not so that you could still remain in the place with nothing, so that you could finally have something. Let's take advantage of what Jesus got us, my goodness. Verse 8, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. Verse 9, But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? Y'all, do you really want to go back to the things? that God brought you out of? Maybe some moments you have that feeling like, maybe it would be better, you know? I had more fun then. I feel like I didn't feel as guilty as much. <laughs> well, yeah, because you didn't have the conscience that was touched by God yet. Man, I tell you what, I've had people that have literally told me, I've had people that have literally told me, they said, man, I, I just can't get saved. And I'm like, well, why, you know, talking to them about it. I said, because I'm going to start feeling bad about the things I do. <laughs> they don't want to feel bad about it. They're like, I don't want to feel bad about this. Oh, man. I'm sorry I'm laughing, but it's just like, they obviously felt bad about it kind of already, the fact that they were coming up with it because their conscience was already, you know what I'm saying? But it's just something like, listen, don't avoid love that you could never uh, understand. Don't avoid peace that passes all understanding. Don't like opt out of the greatest things ever just because you're going to have a conscience now and actually have to be better. <laughs> so praise God. Verse nine, uh, verse 10, you are observing special days and months, seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. I plead with you, brothers, become like me, for I became like you. You have done me no wrong. Become like me. Some of y'all could be like, who is this guy? guy just full of a bunch of arrogance what are you talking about become like me it's all about jesus i totally agree it's all about jesus but what he's saying is i paid a price to be an example i taught you what jesus told me to say it weren't my own words and the example that i'm showing you i have confidence in it's not me i have confidence in jesus who's in me and how he works in me he can work in you that's awesome as you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. Even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. What has happened to your joy? Pause. What has happened to all your joy, you who are listening to me? Are you still filled with joy? Do you still have the joy of the Lord every day you walk on? Can I just ask this question? What has happened to some of your joy? Jesus wants you filled with joy. Jesus has given you all of the benefits and rights to the inheritance. What has happened to your joy? You know that joy doesn't come from any of the things we seek it for. We seek joy in relationships with other people. There's some joy that can be brought from that for sure. But that's not the fulfilling joy God's talking about. We seek joy in uh, marriages or dating or we seek joy in a job. We're trying to seek happiness in so many places. But true joy is found when you get peace with God and you know your purpose in life. True satisfaction and joy. I pray for every single person watching today that God would reveal to you your purpose today for today, for this season, in a way you've never known with clarity. And I'm praying as well that the love of God would fill your hearts through His precious Holy Spirit so you can find that joy. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Verse 16. Some people just don't like hearing y'all the truth. They only will love you if you say and agree with the things that they believe and the things they're doing. But once you begin to say the truth, it challenges things inside of them. And some people just don't want to hear it. Those people are zealous to win you over, verse 17. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you will be zealous for them. It is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good. And to be so always and not just when I am with you, my dear children, for whom am I again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you? This man, Paul, loved these people so much, he personally said, I'm birthing you. I have invested in you so much, and my heart is with you. My prayers have been with you. My teaching, I invested time that literally I am now taking personal responsibility to say, listen, you're not just in my heart. I'm going to birth you through the Spirit. I'm going to birth you in prayer. I, until you are fully, for, fully formed into who you're supposed to be, I'm going to keep praying until it happens. I'm going to keep teaching until it happens. Parents, are you listening? 
Until your kids are fully formed into the who they're supposed to be in God, you got to keep praying. You got to keep birthing something. If they're young enough and they're still in your house, you got to take time to teach them the word of God. You got to sit down with them with this growth book. You got to have a personal Bible study. Are you taking full responsibility for the people who are in your life and saying, listen, God, you put them in my life. I'm going to help birth these people out in the spirit through your help. It's a lot right there, guys. It's powerful. Think about what I'm saying. God wants you to be part of the process. Verse 20, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I'm perplexed about you. He's, he's having to come in a pretty intense tone right now when he's writing because he's not able to be with them in person. All they're getting is a letter. He's saying, but this is tough. What I'm hearing is going on with you guys. Verse 21, tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? Verse 22, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman, the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born to the ordinary way, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of the promise. He's saying that, listen, you guys could just keep on trying to do these things in your own power, these own strength, your own laws, and get the promise. You don't get the promise going through the laws in the old way. You get the promise by going through the Spirit. It's got to be the Spirit of God who's leading you. It's got to be what the Spirit says. It's got to be what the Spirit of the Holy Ghost is doing by giving you strength. You can't attain the promise you want. The results you're going for, you're going about it wrong. You cannot get the results you're wanting for, uh, through the ways that you're going about this. More laws, more do's, more no's, no rights. You've got to get it through the power of the Holy Ghost. It's not by might. It's not by your power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord God. Come on, y'all. Let's go do it God's way. You'll get his promises and results. These things may be taken figuratively, for the woman represents two covenant. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and builds children who are to be slave. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia. It corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. Hagar's from the Old Testament. You remember the book of Genesis. She was the one who Abraham was supposed to have the promised child, Isaac. But he was 99. No kids were happening. So he's like, Lord, let me help you out with this. I'm getting a little old. Uh, let me help you out because your timing isn't my timing. I need this thing to happen now and your timing's already passed. Maybe you just forgot, Lord. It's okay. Let me help you. Let me do that. That's where Ishmael comes from. Is When you try to help God, you always form an Ishmael. But if you trust God's timing you will have the promise. But you can get so many counterfeits because you get involved in the process, you get impatient with God's time. This is in every area of your life. And you know what? You'll get a counterfeit because you try to help God out. He does not need our help. He needs our obedience. Hallelujah. And our trust. For it is written, Be glad, O barren woman who bears no children. Break forth and cry aloud. You have no labor pains, because more of the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Verse 28. Now you brothers like Isaac are children of the promise. At that time the son born in the ordinary was persecuted, the son born of the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. Woo! But what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son. What does that mean in your life? Get rid of the counterfeits. Stop accepting and settling for counterfeits. Man, I could say that again, and I'm going to. Stop settling for counterfeits. Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance. It will never be compared to the full promise. It will never be compared to what God had in his heart for you. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, but we are children of the free woman. We are children of God. We've been adopted as a son. We're given his inheritance. He wants you to have the best. He doesn't want you to have a counterfeit. He doesn't want you to settle. God wants you to have his best. Don't settle for the counterfeits. It's time for some of us to throw out the slave woman. It's time for some of us to kick out that boyfriend. It's time for some of us to stop settling for relationships that are not God's best. It's time for some of us to stop settling for a life of depression, a life of hopelessness when that's not what God wants for you. It's time for some of us to say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve God and we're going to get the promises he wants for us. Y'all, 
I believe for you. Have an incredible week this week. I hope this has empowered you, encouraged you. Pray right now. Once this video is done, I want you to get in the presence of God. If you have a couple minutes right now, when you press stop on this video, turn on some worship music. Get in his presence. Say, God, is there anything in me that's settling, Lord? Because I'm a son. I'm a daughter. I'm an heir to the promise. And God, I want what you want for me to have. Show me, Lord. Give me clarity in my life. Give me strength to make the decision. We love you so much. God bless you. See you next week with whoever the pastor is. It's going to be good. Giving you Galatians 5. Stay in your Bible. Love you.